Hey YouTubers, it's Charlie. Hopefully you guys have all had a chance to see the book three finale. Since it's two episodes combined, this is gonna be a top 10 video instead of like my normal top five. I know a lot of you still have big questions about book four with all the changes in the show moving to digitally only. Don't worry, they are finishing book four as we speak and it's also gonna be all digital, but it is guaranteed. No official release date, but planned for next summer until we hear otherwise. Also a reminder, the giveaway is going to continue for another couple weeks. All you have to do to enter that is be a subscriber and leave a comment below. But it's basically like a once a week kind of thing. By the time I post my book four predictions video, I'll try to explain what the rest of my bonus videos are going to look like in the off season. But onto the important stuff, let's try and help each other through this. So careful for spoilers if you haven't seen the episodes yet, but here are my top 10 moments. Number 10, Korra gives herself up. There were a whole lot of Last Airbender parallels in the way the finale went down. Korra making the hard choice to turn herself in really reminded me of the Sozin's Comet Part 2 moment, you know, where Aang ran off to meditate and then came to the conclusion that he would have to kill Ozai, which was completely against all of his beliefs as an airbender. I kind of like that at the end of all things, neither one ended up killing their enemy. But Korra makes that choice not knowing if she'll survive. She's the gung-ho avatar, which is like the polar opposite of Aang, who was the reluctant avatar. I feel like if any of you get into arguments with your friends about whether or not Korra is selfish, this would be a really good scene to show them as evidence that she is not. But moving on to number 9, Tenzin is totally not dead. This made me so happy. He's such a guiding force, not just for Korra herself, but for the series in general. Losing him would be like losing your compass in the South Pole. I feel like the only people that could step in and fill that role if Tenzin ever left the series would be Jinora or Zuko. Based on the way the finale presented her, I would definitely say that Jinora is the future. I'll talk a lot more about Jinora as I work my way through this list, just because she is now like the most interesting character in the series. But number eight, the big double cross. This is one of the most creative uses of waterbending I have seen so far. Book two pushed it further than I'd ever seen it before that with the water drills, but Mingwa or Great Zalao, or however you want to think about her, pushed the limits of waterbending the same way Zaheer pushed the limits of airbending. Aside from Katara's crazy healing powers, I don't know, you know, what the flying equivalent of waterbending would be. We've already seen crazy powerful bloodbending from Amon, and Avatar Last Airbender spent a lot of time showcasing Katara's special abilities, which I guess has kind of been what ming Hua has been to Book 3, like the super evil version of Katara. We actually never got to see Katara in her prime, like as an adult waterbender, so I guess we'll never know who would have been more powerful. But number 7, Team Beifong takes down Pali. One of the coolest takedowns all season, metal bending her armor around her head so the blast splattered her brains. Let me know if you think that that was like the most violent kill so far. The Earth Queen's death was slow agony so you know maybe that was a little bit more gruesome to watch but I feel like it was implied that Pali's death was the grossest. I was also really happy when Zaheer confirmed he did kill the Earth Queen whenever he pushed Kor's father off the cliff. So confirmed, no Earth Queen in book 4. As good as that is, the Earth Kingdom is a complete shitstorm right now. Like, it is going to be one of the big problems of Book 4 for them to solve. That whole fight scene, though, was just absolutely amazing. The animation was incredible. There were a lot of specific moments where I thought they pushed the limits of the animation in just amazing ways, so I'll try and mention them as I talk about each of the scenes. Korra fighting wall handcuff was also super badass. I would challenge any of you to try and do that, like tie your legs up and then try to fight somebody. But number 6, holy shit, Zaheer can fly. This is where all the Guru Lahima stuff started to make sense. It was a literal thing, meaning the void was more of a spiritual vacuum for emotion and earthly attachment than some sort of like creepy journey into death. I liked that it was like a really big callback to Guru Pathik trying to get Avatar Aang to let go of earthly attachment with the chakras. I feel like the show presents bending as being like a very separate thing, like the different forms of bending, but I wonder if at a certain level they're all connected. Like energy bending is different from other forms of bending, but you know, what if they are all just different forms of energy bending? Like everyone is tending the same garden, just some focus on different areas of it based on their personalities. That doesn't really take the lion turtles into account, but let me know if you think that book four is going to build on all the new things we've learned about bending science. Actually, bending science sounds like a really awesome class that they should teach at a university in Republic City. Like that would be amazing. Just the science of bending. I thought that the Zaheer Pili moment was really bittersweet and a nice touch. Despite him being completely Looney Tunes, I think his emotions for her were completely genuine. I don't think that he was manipulating her. I think that Mike and Brian just needed that scene to show that she was his earthly attachment and once she was gone, he just let everything go and literally entered the void. Did anyone else think that he was walking on clouds whenever the camera panned out and showed him for the first time? Just for a sec, I thought that he would just walk away on the clouds instead of flying away. But his flight animation was so amazing. I really liked the way they captured the physics of how an airbender would actually be moving through the air. 
I think what he was doing was airbending himself. Like he wasn't airbending the molecules around him like a traditional airbender would. But let me know if you have an alternate interpretation. This made me think a lot about the subbending this season. I feel like Jinora's astral projection was supposed to be the actual subform of airbending. But did anyone else think that Zaheer's weightlessness was actually the intended subform that Mike and Brian had been talking about? I think it's like earthbending, you know, having two different subforms. So now airbending has the subform of astral projection and weightlessness, which leads me to number five, Bolin is the lava bender. I think we all collectively felt like he was going to get a subform this season. I actually thought it was going to be metal bending, but I would have liked it better if Gazan had taught him how to do it. I guess it just wasn't quite enough time to give them like their own story arc. Like back during book one where Tenzin was trying to teach Korra how to airbend, he had this really amazing lesson arc where he was just teaching her about the mechanics of airbending and I feel like we didn't get that for lava bending. Like I still don't understand the mechanics of lava bending. The wiki in real life explains it in a cursory way, but I just like it when the show gets really spiritual with the way it explains bending. I feel like the really heartbreaking moment though from that whole sequence with the lava was the destruction of the Northern Air Temple. It was like watching a priceless work of art get destroyed. You know, you just cringe. Oh, you just like, oh God. Even though the Air Nomads are going to be roaming around, I still think that at some point they will rebuild that temple. It seems too important not to. But moving on to number four, Zaheer tries to kill Korra in the Avatar state. I feel like we all collectively were thinking of the last Airbender book two finale when we saw this scene, especially with all the green crystals lying around. The outcome was essentially the same. Aang went into a coma, effectively rendering him inert until book three, and Korra is severely disabled. So there were a whole lot of things inside that cave that I noticed specifically. You know, not only all the crazy faces and the morphing, like the really awesome anime sequence that they took it to, especially with the way they animated Korra's face, but I also noticed that the Dai Li were working for the Red Lotus, which makes me wonder if the Red Lotus used the Dai Li to guide the Earth Queen's mistakes. Like they counseled her to make decisions that would set the Earth Kingdom on a path to destruction. I'll talk more about that during my book four predictions video, but I definitely think there are more Red Lotus people that we'll meet. I actually did think the core was going to die for a little bit. And whenever they animated her face in that really anime way, when her eyes bugged out, I went a little nuts. I feel like Studio Mir has done a really good job of pushing Korra in a more anime direction this year, which makes me feel like we'll see more scenes animated in this way during book four. Mike and Brian have already said that another studio is helping finish book four, but Studio Mir is animating pretty much every episode. They're just getting like a little bump just because animating is such a time intensive process. But moving into top three now, Korra is rescued by the airbenders. One of the coolest uses of bending all season. It reminds me that there are still a lot of creative innovations in bending that we haven't seen yet. I'm really interested to see if we see some unusual fire bending in the Fire Nation during book four. Let me know if you agree, but I feel like Jinora's air vacuum was like a big callback to her saving Rava in the book two finale. Like Jinora has made a big finale save two times in a row now, which makes me feel like Mike and Brian are positioning her out front for like a spin-off comic, or at least presenting her as the future of the Avatar universe. Like for whenever they stop telling Korra driven stories. It's like whenever they make Zuko the protagonist of the Search comic. I feel like we're just going to see something like that from Jinora. But on to number two, Korra versus Zaheer. It reminded me a lot of that Aang scene from book one when he first learned that the Air Nation had been massacred. So he flipped out hardcore and just went into the Avatar state and no one could talk to him. Like he was completely spaced out. I feel like since then, Last Airbender and Korra have done a really good job of explaining some of the positives and negatives of being in the Avatar state. It's so powerful that your conscious mind is suppressed and you literally become a force of nature. So if you're not highly trained, the potential for collateral damage is really high and you become super vulnerable. The whole battle scene was an amazing callback to the Sozin's Comet battle with some twists. I mean, that was all I could think about whenever they were flying around fighting each other. The big twists, obviously, were that Korra was using firebending to fly like Ozai and Zaheer was using airbending like Aang. And then to call it back to Aang again, whenever Beifong earthbended Zaheer's prison, it was just like the scene wherever Aang took Yukon's bending. And remember, at the end of both those big battles, neither Aang nor Korra killed their enemy. But finally, my favorite moment from the finale, obviously, Jinora's master ceremony. I will freely admit to crying a little, maybe a lot. This is probably the best callback to Last Airbender, or at least my favorite. It was like whenever Aang got his ceremony at the end of book one, he was accepting his role as the Avatar. And here, Jinora was just accepting her role as the new spiritual leader of the Air Nation. Just to clarify, I think Tenzin was saying that she's basically going to be leading the Air Nation and he'll just be counseling her. It's a huge payoff to the father-daughter relationship story they had this year. It's him acknowledging her abilities and maturity. So I feel like this season would be a great story arc for any of you girls out there to watch with your dads, especially if you want to get your parents into Avatar. 
So I have all kinds of thoughts about book four. I'm going to save that for my predictions video, which I'll try to get out tonight just while it's all fresh in our heads. But let me know, what were your favorite moments from the finale? And what was like the first reaction you had after finishing the episodes? I think the first thing I did was post a picture of Aang crying. Like that was my immediate reaction. Lots of crying. Overall, I gave both these episodes a solid A+. I feel like this is the strongest Korra finale so far. I love the way they altered all the characters. I thought the narrative was a lot more engaging and cohesive than previous seasons too. And they continued to push the boundaries of animation in the series. Just to explain a little bit more about the animation, there was this really awesome podcast that Mike and Brian just did. I'll add a link for it in the description where they basically talk about the animation in the series. The interview was great, but amongst the many things that they talked about, they explained the way that they run their shows, like letting animators be animators based on the style that they want for Korra. For example, on most animated shows in the United States, the overseas animators are really limited to what they can do. Like, they're not allowed to be real animators or innovate or bring new ideas to the table. But Mike and Brian have tried to find a way to allow some of that creativity back into the process mostly by finding animators that can pull off what they have in mind and allowing new ideas during the animation process. I think that's why a lot of the Beifong flashbacks look so amazing. They were a totally different animation style than the normal core episodes, and you would not see that in like a typical animated children's show. I think it's a really good example of the attention they give to the creative process and one of the best things overall about the Avatar series in general. Most of the feelings I have about the series right now are completely optimistic. They were pretty clear though that after book four, they would not be animating another Avatar series. They'll be doing something, just not Avatar. Speaking of which, actually one of the bonus videos that I'm playing in the next couple of days is like a top 10 Mike and Brian interview moments from that podcast, just because they go into such a level of detail from behind the scenes, like what's going on with the series, what they felt about the Avatar movie. It was so amazing. The most interesting thought that I'll leave you guys with is that Mike and Brian said that because animation takes so long, they've already wrapped up everything that you have big questions about. Any hanging plot line or character you feel got dropped, like Azula for instance, they've all addressed it in future book 4 episodes. So you can feel happy knowing that most of your biggest questions will be answered during book 4, but I'll try to address a lot of the specific ones during my predictions video, so I'll try and post that tonight. There's a whole lot of stuff going on this weekend, so I'll try to get everything out as fast as possible. But right now, you can click here to get that predictions video. I'll add the annotation as soon as I post it. And you can click here to get my next Quora Q&A. That might be Monday before I post that video. Just quick heads up. So thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys tonight. Everybody, go hug your Sky Bison because we're all probably still crying just a little inside. <laughs>